virtues, and uh, he died from the plague. The plague rolled into Italy, uh, and he started caring for those that were afflicted by the plague, caught it himself, and later passed away from it. So he is the patron saint of youth, because he died at the age of 23 and was uh, someone who was involved with the education of the youth in his time. His spiritual director was St. Charles Borromeo, uh, as an interesting aside. So we pray in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. O God, giver of heavenly gifts, who in St. Aloysius Gonzaga join penitence to a wonderful innocence of life, grant through his merits and intercession that though we have failed to follow him in innocence, we may imitate him in penitence. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome to class three. This uh, topic is, in some ways, uh, the most controversial we'll cover, uh, which is good on a hot day. Uh, the document on the liturgy. Uh, which was uh, the first document that was completed by Vatican II. The Latin term for that is Sacrosanctum Concilium, or if you're a, an Italian speaker, Concilium. They love the CHs. Uh, the Constitution on the Liturgy. And the headline about the document is Active Participation. Active Participation of the Laity in the Mass, in Liturgy. Next week, we will then take on Gaudium et Spes, hope and joy, the consti pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. We'll then take a week off for the Independence Day holiday and come back on Tuesday, July 12th with kind of a overview wrap up, a little more theology, and then we'll talk about ecumenism and religious liberty, which was also highly controversial at the council and in the aftermath. So here we go. As I mentioned, this document was voted on and passed in December of 1963. And this was the most concrete change from Vatic Vatican II in the day-to-day -day lives of us, of the laity, and frankly, the priests. It was the thing that was the most noticeable that changed, coming in and out of the council. So why reform the time-honored Tridentine Mass that had been the Mass for, of the Church in the West for 400 plus years, and in some ways longer? As I mentioned, this was the first document the Council Fathers wanted to get done and, and get done properly. Why? Uh, this priority reflects the, the headline that John Paul the 20, John Paul, John the 23rd wanted to instill a new vigor, a new energy into Christian living. And the liturgy was one of the top things on his mind for reform. And this w reflects that priority. As mentioned by Father Britton in his book, Reclaiming Vatican II, the prioritization of this document reveals a deep spiritual truth about the place of worship in Christian living, namely that adoring and glorifying God comes before all else. If the church cannot celebrate the liturgy faithfully and reverently, then all her other tasks will fall short. So did you know the word orthodoxy in Greek means right worship, right praise? And many of the early Christian Fathers, think of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was a first century, early second century bishop who was martyred in Rome. When he was fighting against the people who didn't think Jesus was really human, his first objection is they can't worship properly then. The theological debates of Jesus being divine and human were somewhat secondary to St. Ignatius. It was the worship would have been compromised. The adoration of God would have been compromised because we need Jesus' humanity and divinity together to make contact with God. So just an interesting note that orthodoxy, first, in its first sense, means right or proper worship. Not necessarily doctrinal orthodoxy, which is, of course, very important. So just a little note. 
in, in the in the tenth paragraph of the document we read nevertheless the liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed at the same time it is the font from which all her powers flow for the aim and object of apostolic works is that all who are made sons of God by faith and baptism should come together to praise God in the midst of his church to take part in the sacrifice and to eat the Lord's Supper. So the context for these changes that came with the liturgy really had a history prior to Vatican II. <clears throat> Think of the reforms of St. Pius X, who was uh, the Pope toward the end of the 19th century and well into the 20th century up till 1914. Oops, yeah, there we go. Uh, he in fact called out active participation in a document in 1903. Interestingly, he lowered the age of communion in children from 12 to 7. He encouraged daily communion. There's actually a beautiful story around why he lowered the age, a non-Tridentine reform, I might add. It's interesting, the St. Pius X Society take their namesake from someone who was altering uh, those who could receive communion. Uh, but uh, the reason why he did that uh, was he was inspired by a story of a little girl who was an orphan taken in by a religious order of nuns, and she was dying. She was four years old. Her name was Nellie, and they, the order received special permission to give her communion. And they needed special permission because the age was 12. She received communion, was given a little locket with a, a cross on it, which she wore around her neck, and died and was buried in the locket. A year or two later, uh, the order wanted to move some of the graves of the order to another location, and they exhumed her body, and she was incorrupt, and the locket was as shiny as it was the day they buried it. That story inspired St. Pius X to lower the communion age to seven from 12. I actually can remember my grandmother uh, on my mom's side talking about this. She was born in 1895 and she mentioned that she was 15 at the time this change came and she was happily and in, in a nostalgic way remembering how she had to wait until she was 12 and now everyone else seven. So. St. Pius X was a very pastoral pope who was looking forward to a time when the church would be more engaged liturgically, and these reforms reflect that. Pius XI urged the faithful not to be strangers or silent spectators at Mass. A tremendous amount of theological research, research began prior to World War I and intensified after the wars, uh, from wonderful church fathers who influenced the bishops at Vatican II. I mentioned a few of their names here. Father de, de Lubach, who was an expert uh, periti at the council, uh, mentioned that everyone was reading a man named Father Louis Bouillet, who we'll spend some time talking about. And then Pius XII again encouraged the laity to join in the work of salvation in the sacrifice of the Mass, not as observers. So interesting how this started to gather momentum in the early part of the 20th century. Father Louis Bouillet was probably one of the more influential liturgical theologians of the time, uh, and I remain uh, influenced by his writings. He actually visited my college uh, in the 80s, and I heard him speak on some of these subjects on the liturgy. Uh, it's interesting, the, the group that I mentioned here in the sub-bullet point, the, they started a journal called Communio with Han Urs von Balthasar, Father Bishop Cardinal Ratzinger, and Louis Bouillet. And Louis B Bouillet was also asked by Paul VI to join the International Theological Commission when it started as one of the founding members, so highly influential. And in many of his works, and one is in the bibliography in your handout, he traces the origin of the liturgy first in the worship of the Jewish synagogue, and then later how that influenced the architectural 
designs and activities of the liturgy in Christianity in the first uh, four or five centuries. And what's interesting about uh, the Jewish liturgy is that the people with the rabbi all faced toward Jerusalem at key moments of their liturgy. They faced toward Jerusalem because that represented a kind of future time restoration of the Messiah, perhaps in the political order, reclaiming the land that they had lost to the Babylonians. So it had a, a trans-historical, trans-future looking view of we all face east with the rabbi uh, in our worship. And, and this had huge significance for the layouts of synagogues uh, as well. He also describes the readings that would take place. We might even remember the gospel passage where Jesus reads from the scroll uh, in the synagogue uh, and sits down and then says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing today. Uh, as portending the Christian liturgy that will take over. So he spends a lot of time just talking about the Day of Atonement rituals of the Jews, uh, the Ark of the Covenant being in the Holy of Holies, and how that had a special pace, place of prominence toward Jerusalem. And so by everyone facing the Ark, facing Jerusalem, there are people, a pilgrim people, looking toward an eschatological future, an end time where the Messiah returns again and restores Israel. Remember one of Jesus' followers, Simon the Zealot, the Zealots were interested in the political restoration of the Jews. These are some diagrams from the work. You'll see what I'm getting at, though, where you have the seating all facing toward Jerusalem. And there are different variations of this on the synagogues that have been excavated in Palestine. There's been probably uh, about 100 sites that have been uncovered, and maybe 12 or 15 of them are pre-4th century. The vast majority that have been discovered are post Constantine, post early fourth century. But you see the layout here is, is similar. It's just the prominence given to the Ark or the symbolic representation of the Ark of the Covenant, the readings that would go on in this kind of cutout area. Think of it as a, as a sectioned off area uh, and so on. Everyone facing the same direction. How did this affect uh, Christian practice? Most historians think that for the first 300 years of Christianity up to Constantine, the dominant form of worship was in house churches, with some exceptions, uh, but house churches were more suitable because if you're a persecuted religion, you're not exactly going to build a large cathedral in the middle of Rome and expect it to survive. <laughs> uh, you're not going to be waving a flag about it. So. Um, not a lot is known. There are ruins that give indications of grand halls in wealthy people's homes that could be used for liturgy and worship. Uh, but what gets really interesting in the fourth century is in Palestine and particularly in Syria, the layouts. And what's interesting about the layouts is that they resemble the synagogue worship layout, but go a few steps in the Christian direction. Namely, they're no longer facing Jerusalem. They're facing east to the rising sun. Why? What's the significance of the rising sun? Well, that again has an eschatological significance of the end times. Jesus' second coming, he will come with the sun rising, the light of the world. So these early... Syrian churches, which are the earliest ones we have in the West, uh, face east. And many, uh, that, that significance will continue in many cases. Uh, as I also mentioned, uh, the altar table now replaces the Ark of the Covenant. 
And I didn't mention it so much about the readings in the synagogue, but the, the places of prominence for the readings from the Old Testament for, of the Jews is replaced by a book of the Gospels on an ambo, like this kind of lectern, but much more uh, decorative and significant and might be even elevated slightly. So you have the rise of uh, the Word of God in liturgies as well. Bouillet notes that the Moses chair, which was maybe where some of the readings were done and possibly where Jesus sat down after he read, was not replaced by seating for the clergy, but as I mentioned, often the book of the Gospels would be put on a chair, if not an ambo or a lectern. So the layout promotes clergy and laity all facing and worshiping God in the same direction, looking east for the Eucharistic sacrifice in particular. So word of God proclaimed, perhaps some preaching, and then turn east for the Eucharistic prayer and sacrifice of the Mass, all looking, worshiping God. Quote, the whole assembly, far from being a static mass of spectators, remains an organic gathering of worship, worshiper, first centered on the ark for hearing and meditating upon the scriptures, and finally going toward the east altogether for the Eucharistic prayer and final communion. So the priest or bishop might be at the center of the building or the church, uh, but the focus is always the transcendent looking east or looking toward the sun, I should say, of, of uh, the day that Christ comes again. So Jesus Christ is the focus of worship, his coming. And though hierarchically organized, the assembly is acting as one body of Christ, one people of God facing east. As Louis Bouillet would say, there's no clerical arrangement of laity staring at the clergy as entertainer or clergy staring at the laity, because this is what prevents full participation, which we'll get into later. So here's a diagram. There's many diagrams he goes through, but you see the altar is often more prominently in the eastern wing of the church. The, the book of the Gospels might be here. Uh, and then the seating would be like a horseshoe. Uh, these chancels are, it's a word for dividers, uh, but you'd, you'd have horseshoe assembly of the people with the priest here, but people around him and then turning toward the east for the Eucharist. Bouillet then tracks how did this all change, because it did change. And he surveys uh, the ruins, and we even have old drawings, architectural and engineering drawings, of how they built the cathedrals and churches, even if those churches don't survive, which is interesting. What begins to happen with post-Constantine, as the church is now recognized as a legitimate religion in the empire, Bishops all of a sudden become very important imperial officials. They often, due to the charitable works of feeding the poor, running hospices and hospitals, are some of the most important administrative people in a city. And so the bishop's chair is centrally located and it starts moving east in what's called the asp, in a position of prominence there starts this separation between clergy and laity in the congregation, physically, in the space. It's no longer one assembly gathered around a priest or bishop together praising God, but there becomes this physical separation that starts and it accelerates all through up to even Gregory the Great in the 6th and 7th century. You look at some of the cathedrals uh, that Charlemagne had influence on, the one at um, Aachen, uh, it, it is even more uh, extended. Uh, the bishops acquire more imperium, more regalia, 
uh, the altars move further away. And for Bouye, this represents a corruption of the original Christian worship. But it would influence the development of liturgy throughout the West. And uh, though some more modern day research would debate how central this was, for example, in parts of England, uh, some of this perhaps pre-existed, uh, these developments in the West, uh, the main point remains, as the church became more powerful in a uh, political sense, the bishops and priests began to, in the liturgy, become more removed from the congregation. And so you have this distancing that traces itself even into the medieval times and that the medieval liturgy for the laity became a spectacle to be observed, not participated in, and part of an unfortunate, as Bouillet puts it, clericalization of the mass. You know, very different than a kind of cosmic liturgy, the cosmic Christ coming with the rise of the sun that we all face east. There's a subtle shift going on. And then uh, Bouillet also traces Byzantine churches that have retained more of this notion of the horseshoe of the people around the bishop and priest facing east. Uh, Hagia Sophia is a prime example of this. And we don't have the time to spend on all the architectural ins and outs. It's probably its own course, and you'd need another lecturer. Uh, but uh, you see how this begins to unfold differently in the East versus the West. This is more uh, Eastern style, but in Western churches, but you see what's happening. This is 9th, 10th century layouts. <laughs> They're getting more like a rectangle, longer, longer, further removed, further removed, for more watching, more, you know, so on. This is I, one of my favorite cathedrals in Europe is Chartres. Uh, this is a, a huge, massive, beautiful cathedral. I'll, I'll take questions later. I, I just have so much to get through. Um, but you, I mean, it's a, it's a good eight iron from here to the altar. So, um, so Bouillet's comments uh, toward the end of this portion of the book, uh, I'd like to read to you, quote, we must not confuse participating in the celebration with looking at it. The practice of looking curiously at the Eucharistic elements themselves, especially at the time of consecration, is a practice unknown to Christian antiquity. It was introduced only in the late 13th century, together with the double elevation at that moment. More generally, the concentration on seeing what the officiants do, far from having ever accompanied a real participation of all in the liturgy has appeared as compensation for the lack of participation and is psychologically more or less exclusive of it. It is perfectly understandable. Either you look at somebody doing something for you instead of you, or you do it with him. You can't do both at the same time. In Christian antiquity, even if the bishop or priest alone said the Eucharistic prayer, all Christians, clergy and laity praying with him in the same position, in the same direction, answering him at the preface and at the conclusion, were perfectly aware of the fact that what he said was said in the name of all. The idea of him turning to them or them turning to him so that they could see him doing the Eucharist could not arise and in fact never arose except long after they had completely ceased to think that he did it not just for them, but with them. Interesting way of, of summing up. Uh, I, I find there's a lot of insight in that, uh, just from a room dynamic point of view. So for Bouillet, facing and watching the priest face us is a clericalistic, imperial way of participating at Mass, versus we all face in the same direction, east, for the Eucharistic prayer. This what I call an eschatological facing toward the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then we're all participating properly together in the only real power in heaven on earth. This is often referred to in Latin as ad orientem. 
facing the people is odd versus populum. So if you read articles about the raging controversy on this subject, that's what those expressions are referring to. Just a little humor uh, as we move through. But it, the, behind the humor, there's a, a certain basic reality that I think jumps off the page from the cartoon. You have the, the priest saying, we praise you, Lord, looking toward the cross, or we praise you, Lord, looking at the people who are looking maybe at the priest, maybe at the cross. You see how it, it's a little muddled, isn't it? So which makes sense? And in truth, the answer is both can make sense. But for Louis Bouillet, everyone facing the same way in the Eucharistic moments of the Mass makes the most sense. And I tend to agree with him. If we read from Bishop Barron, uh, pivoting a bit here, and this is his work on the four documents of Vatican II that was recently published with a running commentary of the popes and Bishop Barron. Uh, it's a nice little work entitled The Word on Fire, Vatican II Collection. Quote, the Council Fathers say the liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed and the font from which all her power flows, implying that the Mass is the place where the Catholic thing is most thoroughly displayed and realized. If we want to understand who God is, who Christ is, who we are in relation to God, and what our mission and purpose might be, we look to the Eucharistic liturgy. This is furthermore precisely why the liturgy is so crucial in regard to the conversation with culture. The central prayer of the church radiates, radiates outward and shapes the worlds of arts, of art, politics, economics, and so on. The fathers of the church interpreted Adam before the fall as the prototypical priest and the Garden of Eden as a kind of primordial temple. The right praise, orthodoxy, by Adam was meant to infiltrate every aspect of life, coming in time to Edenize the world. This is what is meant by this fully conscious and active participation that we must have in the Mass, because we are transformed by looking east. We then go out into the world and Edenize or Christify the world. As Vatican II said in the document on the liturgy, Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. Such participation by the Christian people as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people, is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. In the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else, for it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful derive the true Christian spirit. And therefore, pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it by means of necessary instruction in all their pastoral work. So again, this emphasis on active, full, participation, because it's the source of our spiritual life. Now, this is where we get into the business end of things, uh, namely the implementation coming out of Vatican II. I mentioned toward the end of last class that Vatican II never published a catechism the way that the Council of Trent did, which was the executive summary, so to speak, of here's what was really important. <laughs> and Vatican II didn't do that, and that was probably a mistake. And in particular, it was a mistake because the guidelines given on the liturgy were too open-ended and vague. More importantly, Vatican II did not take advantage of the rich liturgical theology that was developed prior to the Council. The document spends a lot of time on rubrics, positioning, what's appropriate for holiness and sanctification without really defining what that really meant concretely. 
for a global church in particular. So it was left to bishops' conferences throughout the world in different manners to implement norms that eventually came out after the council guiding the reform of the liturgy. But active participation in the laity became a multicolored rainbow. It meant different things to different people. And we've all lived through what that looked like. The good, the bad, the ugly, and the very ugly. <laughs> the fight was over rubrics, as I mentioned here. Uh, and there was not enough time spent on what are we doing at Mass? What is the liturgy? It was a fight over compliance. And a lot of those fights were necessary because the reverence of the Mass in its implementation in many cases declined. I would argue the decline was happening anyway, uh, but the poor implementation of the new Mass accelerated that decline. People heard things they'd never seen before that were outrageous. We've all seen the YouTube videos of masses with balloons. Uh, if you went through 50 years of, of this, it, it's a clown car of, of people uh, trying to be exciting, entertaining, uh, and, uh, and it was nonsense and it drove many people away. Unfortunately, bishops countenanced this without necessarily supporting it, uh, but their priests would alter the rituals uh, in direct violation of the document on the liturgy. Just from a business point of view, I've spent a lot of my time in my business career implementing things, often globally. And I'll give you an example. I used to work for a toy company. Our US des designers were in the US. Our engineers, our product and manufacturing engineers were in China. Just making changes to that product development process across two or three countries took a lot of meetings, took a lot of detailed meetings. And we didn't do anything until everyone was nodding in agreement that this makes sense for everybody. Now imagine <laughs> rolling out a change that you'd been doing one way for 400 years in one language. Oh, we'll handle that kind of, you know, through experimentation. So just from a, I put here a secular point of view, you can predict the train wreck even before it started. And any business person who's ever managed uh, divisions in different countries just knows this from experience. And of course the bishops and the curial officials in Rome had no idea what box they were opening. So inadequate, what's the scope of the, I mean, you had priests saying, well, if they change Latin in the mass, they can change teaching on sexual morality. I mean, that was the level of, of stupidity. It also gives you a sign of how good was that pre-Vatican II theology again? If, if it could flip so quickly, the preparation was so poor, what, what kind of nostalgia do we have again for that kind of training? Remind me. So uh, it was too open-ended and too much local discretion. So let's begin again. <laughs> what is the liturgy? What is active participation in the laity? I actually have queued up a mass that was said recently in Inverness. I have the Wi-Fi going now in this room. I won't show it because it's just too dreadful, but Right now, masses are being said in Inverness with a, a man waving a big bubble balloon thing, creating big bubbles and singing a celebrate good time come on, with the priest standing right behind him dancing. So this continues, uh, and you can see the reaction to it would be, uh, I'm going somewhere else or I'm running back to something solid, which was the Tridentine Mass, which is very holy and spiritual, life-giving uh, sacrifice of the Mass, uh, but it, it was not necessarily uh, illustrative of the full reform that Vatican II was looking for. So let's begin again. A theology of the liturgy, and I'm taking this right from Vatican II. The wonderful works of God among the people of the Old Testament were but a prelude to the work of Christ, 
the Lord in redeeming mankind and giving perfect glory to God. He achieved his task principally by the Paschal mystery of his blessed passion, resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension. So that's the first hint of what are we doing at Mass, the Paschal mystery. Just as Christ was sent by the Father, so also he sent the apostles filled with the Holy Spirit. This he did that by preaching the gospel to every creature they might proclaim that the Son of God by his death and resurrection had freed us from the power of Satan and from death and brought us into the kingdom of his Father. His purpose also was that they might accomplish the work of salvation which they had proclaimed by means of sacrifice and sacraments around which the entire liturgical life revolves. To accomplish so great a work, Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. Christ indeed always associates the church with himself in this great work wherein God is perfectly glorified and men are sanctified. So the first headline is the liturgy is first and foremost Christ's action, his act of glory to the Father. And that glorification redeems us. How? Because Christ associates us with himself, and we associate ourselves rather hurriedly with him. That's how we're redeemed. Liturgy, in other words, is not our thing. It's not our play thing. It's first Christ's act of adoration of the Father who sent him. It's a very important thing to understand. Rarely talked about, but the Mass is first and foremost Christ's adoration and glorification of the Father who sent him. As Father Blake Britton uh, develops in chapter 3 of his book, Reclaiming Vatican II, which I adapt here. So Jesus comes to save us, certainly. But he also comes to restore right worship of the Father, orthodoxy. Jesus is this bridge of proper adoration. So the liturgy enables this divine encounter. Adoration, sanctification. I call it, in, in modifying Father Britton, this perpetual act of adoration now throughout history, in every mass, in every parish in the world. It continues. So the Eucharistic liturgy is not first a gift to us, though it is a gift to us. It is first Christ's gift to the Father. We are not the center of attention at Mass. It is not particularly about us, though it is about us. It is about Jesus incorporating us into his worship of the Father. We are not the origin of the liturgy. We are participants in the liturgy. You often hear the gathered people, the community gathered, and, and it's left at that. The gathered community doesn't confer anything. We are gathered in Christ. We are swept up in his worship of the Father. The gathered community has no significance unless we are gathered in Christ's worship. This is constantly confused by, by priests everywhere. As if just gathering the community means something significant. You can gather anywhere. You can gather at Gorton Community Center. You can gather on a ball field. You can gather on a... Does that confer this solemn, perpetual act of adoration? No, it doesn't. So you can have mass on the beach. You can have mass in a ballpark. That's not my point. My point is we are gathered by Christ into his act of worship. So this provides the background for what does active participation of the laity then mean. Father Britton makes an interesting point about action in the word in Latin. It's a feminine noun. 
the significance of that, and it was for the ancients and also in Greek philosophy, is action that they had in mind and why it is a feminine noun in Latin is it was always associated with new life, the act of fertility in women, which is the exemplar of something from nothing, of a divine invasion. And so action in the context of active participation in the liturgy implies this prior reception. It's not something we do, it's something we receive, just as the woman receives the seed and new life begins. Something that was not a human life becomes a human life. It is bestowed. This is the significance of action in the context of active participation. We think, oh, we have to do something. And of course, we do. But the core action of the liturgy, of the liturgy is given. It is given by Christ's act of worship of the Father that we are swept up into and participate in. As I put at the bottom here, it was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain. We love because he first loved us. Our action is actually a response to receiving something. Is everyone following this? Okay. And even in the natural order, we see this in, in physics. Uh, if, some, if your soup is hot, it's because it received heat from the flame. If something is moving, something prior put it into motion. A good way of thinking about God as a divine, infinite being is he can give something complete, bestow it. Whereas a finite creature like man, when he tries to create something incomplete, paradoxes emerge because a finite creature cannot bestow anything. It can only receive in thoughts, in the sciences, and so on. So we experience God, a complete being, as a paradox. Providence, free will. How do those reconcile? It's a paradox. Because God is complete, we're finite, we experience it as a paradox. When we try to do something complete on our own, we experience the paradox of incompleteness. It doesn't work. Okay. So, continuing then, active participation in the liturgy first and foremost starts with being prayerfully and reverentially engaged with God's action in the liturgy. An awareness or recognition of, of what Christ is doing, particularly in the sacrifice of the Mass during the Eucharistic prayer. As Father Britton continues, God is the main actor of the sacred liturgy and its central focus. It is he who initiates the action, not us. Active participation does not only mean singing hymns, serving as an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist, or ushering people during communion. These are all good things, and there's a place for them in certain circumstances. But they are secondary, not primary, to active participation. Before all else, Active participation means to be contemplatively and prayerfully engaged in the liturgical action of the Mass, the traditions and official prayers of the Church. Thus, the real action of the liturgy in which we are supposed to participate is the action of God himself. This is what is new and distinctive about Christian liturgy. God himself acts and does what is essential. I would pause there, but if you look at pagan rituals, there's always a proxy. An animal is sacrificed. Crops are sacrificed. Other human beings in that tribe over there that we don't like are sacrificed. There's always a proxy to placate the divine spirits. What's unique about the Christian liturgy, the Mass, is that God supplies his Son. And the Son, in that perfect act of his death and resurrection, in his obedience and adoration of the Father, 
sweeps us up into that act, and we are saved by it, so that he might see and love in us what he sees and loves in Christ. That you, read, you hear that at Mass from time to time. Anytime the sacred books or rites mention action in the liturgy, it is primarily referring to the Eucharistic prayer offered by the priests and actively contemplated by the faithful. Cardinal Ratzinger uh, wrote uh, many works on this, on the liturgy, on the spirit of the liturgy. <clears throat> and an article was written by Ronald uh, Millare in a, uh, in a journal called Nova et Vetera, <clears throat> a student of uh, Dr. Melanie Barrett, I might add, who sits in the back patiently. But, quote, Ratzinger insists that the liturgy is the opus dei or action dei and not the work of man. The false icon that embodies this perversion of worship on the part of the human person is the construction of the golden calf in the book of Exodus. Ratzinger defines the idolization of the golden calf as a self-generated cult, whereby worship becomes a feast that the community gives itself a festival of self-affirmation. Authentic worship is directed towards God and created by him, whereas this anti-worship is the product of the person. Liturgy is God's work or it does not exist at all. Unlike the golden calf, liturgy is not made by the human person alone. Ratzinger asserts that the liturgy cannot be made this is why it has to be simply received as a given reality and continually revitalized. Very interesting uh, perspective from Cardinal Ratzinger. Cardinal Ratzinger in other works goes on to say that Jesus Christ is the responsible actor, the subject of the work of liturgy. He draws us in as historical actors into his perpetual act of adoration of the Father. And that's where our salvation is achieved. As I put at the bottom, a little bit more important than keeping Target or Walmart or Arby's open, although I love that Arby's sandwich. So I, I had to just make that throwaway comment. I might make another one, so sorry about that. So in the end, um, all supplemental liturgical ministries, choir, Eucharistic ministers, readers, sacristans, greeters, and so on, must be guided by this fundamental understanding of active participation. Doing so will surely change the attitude with which each person enacts his or her respective ministry. Choir directors will be keener to select appropriate hymnody that fosters solemnity and contemplation instead of entertainment. Readers and Eucharistic ministers will arrive earlier to Mass so that they can sit in prayerful meditation, preparing their hearts to serve. Priests will maintain a spirit of prayerful vigil in the sacristy as they vest for the sacrifice of the Mass. The main assembly will remain a space of sacred silence both before and after liturgies. Here's one. And Father Britton changed, turned around his parish, which was losing money, declining attendance, uh, and he turned it around in about nine months by implementing one of the key things was sacred silence. And I, I thought I would share with you uh, his list. So sacred silence. When you arrive at Mass, you see someone you know, you shouldn't act like someone just spilled hot soup on your lap. Oh, you know. <laughs> you know. Raising a ruckus, you know, with everyone you meet, glad-handing like you're on a victory tour, you know, going through the aisles. Uh, you know, a little quiet is, is appropriate. Uh, the penitential rites, which as laity we don't have control over this, but in our hearts we may be able to. We shouldn't rush through the penitential rites. If you were, if you had offended someone and you were apologizing, would you just kind of walk by quickly mumbling it, I'm sorry, and keep walking quickly? They would probably question your sincerity. And so when we are uh, praying the, 
Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, uh, there should be some silence before those prayers. There should be silence before the confidior, the I confess to Almighty God. We're about to place ourselves uh, before God, and we need to have a kind of clearing of the decks, a mutual understanding. We're back in good graces. It's not a sacramental confession, uh, but it is a time for us in the gathered community about to enter into the act of worship, which is Christ, to have our sins of a venial variety uh, absolved in that penitential rite. Mortal sins are, of course, not absolved in that. After the homily, after the reception of communion, you know, if after you receive communion, you're shaking hands with people you know in the aisles, you, you, you aren't understanding what has just happened. You've received the body and blood, soul of divinity of Jesus Christ. After Mass, another challenging uh, situation where the Mass ends and we're all chattering, myself included. But we should observe sacred silence for those who are praying quietly around us. And then lastly, you know, the purpose of Mass is not merely to catch up with friends you don't see all the time. We are entering into Christ's act of worship. It's nice to see friends at Mass. It's, it's good to worship together as a community. I'm not poo-pooing that at all. I'm trying to recalibrate our understanding of what are we doing at Mass. We're entering into Christ's act of worship. So, down to policy prescriptions, and we're reaching the end, and then we'll open it up for questions. But I wouldn't be doing the full Summer School of Faith service without talking about implementation. Coming out of Vatican II, and there are big, thick books on this, of between letters from Roman curial officials on the liturgy committees to local dioceses throughout the world, and you have all, it, it, you're, it's like reading uh, a diary from uh, spring debutantes. You know, there's the gushing love of innovation in 1965, and then by 1966, 67, 68, the Roman curial officials are saying, okay, we need to reel that back in now. <laughs> and um, it's interesting, by 1968, 69, uh, it, it was clear to the council fathers and the theologians who inspired Vatican II on the liturgy, they had lost control of it. Now, the Novus Ordo, as written, is a very devout mass. I'm talking about the implementation at the parish level, where churches were gutted uh, and so on. Music was changed. None of that was called for by Vatican II, necessarily. It emphasized a noble simplicity of the Mass, and so at the local scene that meant ripping out communion rails and, and getting rid of statues. That's not what Vatican II meant. Vatican II emphasized a greater awareness of the biblical connection between the Word and sacrament. It encouraged the establishment of liturgical commissions, experts in the liturgy, to assist dioceses and parishes with how to implement the norms of Vatican II. Vatican II remained silent on how the assembly should face. Should it face, should we all face in one direction? Should we face the priest looking at us? It remained silent on that question. In a subsequent directive in like 1966, it said, well, a new construction, you can consider having the priest face the people. That would be an option. Just some other myth busters about the post-Vatican II liturgy in the 1962 Missal. Latin was not eliminated by Vatican II. In fact, it was... Uh, mentioned as a wonderful way of expressing sublime truths of the Mass. It did allow for the use of vernacular, though. It encouraged Gregorian chant. Other changes that we should welcome, I would think, 
is what are called the elimination of parallel liturgies. The priest is doing his thing, I'm saying a rosary. The priest is doing his thing, I'm over at a side chapel praying to the infant of Prague, which was common. And you oldsters all know it was common. The parallel liturgy. I have no idea what the priest is doing. I'm going to be doing my thing until the Eucharistic prayer. Now we pray together. The penitential rite, the scriptures are read to us. We pray the Sanctus together, and so on. We hear the Eucharistic prayers. Before, we didn't. Or if we heard them, thank goodness for the Latin to English Missal. The liturgy of the word receives its own place at the lectern. No longer a kind of side issue at the altar. Homilies are part of the Mass now, formally. And as I mentioned, the Eucharistic can is prayed audibly by the priest. I should mention that before we go to the next slide, you know, I have you know, a missalette here. And part of the confusion that goes on is when priests pray the Eucharistic prayer and they're facing us, over time, they almost pray like they're praying to us, right? Is that the feeling you get? And, you know, waving the chalice around and waving the host around. Uh, and, and so, but let, let me, a little experiment. Eucharistic prayer number one. And, and tell me who, who is the priest praying to? To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts. Who is the priest praying to? The Father. Oh, okay, let's try... Eucharistic prayer number two, maybe we'll get a better outcome. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are we praying to? The Father. Okay, let's try number three. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, Praying to the Father. And the Eucharistic prayer number four, we give you praise, Father most holy, for you. Okay, we're praying to the Father. And yet the feeling with uh, versus popolum is the priest is praying to us. This kind of what's been described in the literature as this anthropocentric turn to us, the gathered community. So something subtle even creeps into, maybe unconsciously, maybe not even on purpose. Priests think they're praying the Eucharistic prayer to us. And you see how that fights against this active participation. Okay, he's praying to us. I don't have to. I'm just passive. We're not facing east. It's not eschatological. It's not Christ's act of worship. It's priest as entertainer. Okay, so recommendations. Now, these are just my opinions, my, my perspective only. So I'm not quoting from Vatican II at all. So if you don't like them, you can blame me. You can't blame Vatican II. So if the Mass is Christ's prayer to the Father for the world, the foundational act of a Christocentric centric cosmos, as Vatican II said, the source and summit of the spiritual life, then please, bishops, don't defer to secular authorities on the manner, time, and possibility of masses being celebrated ever again. Now, this varied by diocese, certainly. Some dioceses had outdoor masses uh, almost immediately. Other dioceses were content to shut everything down, including other sacraments. If you seek the purple or red, you better be prepared to shed blood for the flock. Just so you don't think this is Charles kind of off on a vendor or too much uh, Chardonnay, 
I will quote to you from an article from Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, December 2nd, 2021, in the National Catholic Register. It was, it was a Q&A with him on the COVID restrictions related to sacramental restrictions and shutdowns. I'll just read a few samples. He, he was thinking of, diocese, of dioceses and parishes in Germany, by the way, but his comments were broader as well. But a small minority of dioceses in Germany have been restricting masses to the vaccinated or those recently recovered from a virus. Such a decision, as well as closure of the churches, was, quote, for the cardinal, shocking proof of how far the secularization and dechristianization of thought has already reached the shepherds of Christ's flock, the German cardinal said. He also said, quote, bishops and priests must not offer themselves as courtiers to the rulers of this world and make themselves their propagandists. Now, he did say, in extreme situations, legitimate state authority can impose restrictions. But he, he outlines four conditions. The common good must be the determining factor. What do I mean by that? Well, everyone, needs to be, their needs need to be considered. So if, as we saw rather quickly by the first month of the COVID data, that 95, 97% of the deaths were in people ages 70 and older with comorbidities, thank you. Why, why were not younger people considered as part of the common good, as an example? If you were a, a junior in high school and, and working and hoping your whole life for a scholarship in athletics to go to a, a decent school, all that was taken from you. The mental health issues of the youth and the rises in suicide. So the second condition, the production of the vaccine must be ethically sound. Three, the medical, psychological, and social consequences, which I just described, must be proportionate to the expected benefits. He goes on to talk about regulations that have been compromised and contaminated by financial and political interests, ideological lobbies, and pharmaceutical companies. And so uh, these are some of the comments, but getting to his key comments, and this is the last one I'll, I'll read to you. It is above all contrary to divine law if access to the means of grace of the church the sacraments of Christ are impaired or even forbidden by state authorities. That even bishops have closed their churches or denied sacraments to people seeking help is a grave sin against God. This is shocking proof of how far the secularization has taken place in the shepherds of Christ's flock. So it's not just crazy Charles who thinks this way. Uh, the former prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, made these statements with a certain energy. So my first bullet point there is, don't be a lackey of the state. Don't shut down sacraments. Don't shut down the Mass. Don't shut down the Sacrament of Confession. The laity of a duty and a right to right worship. So enforce liturgical spirituality and norms for your priests with the same energy you did for COVID shutdowns. Invest budget dollars for ongoing education of your priests. Don't think that one and done in the seminary. Continuing education, we do it in business, in the liturgy. Encourage homilies on what is the Mass, what is active participation in the Mass along the lines I've been describing consistent with Vatican II. Support architectural changes where ad orientum can be done. Maybe it can be done. Maybe in other places it, it's not possible, fine. But encourage active participation in the ways we've been describing. For priests and pastors, the Mass is not your work. It's not even the community's work. It is Christ's work with us. Promote active participation by reverently following that sublime ritual that precedes you and is bigger than you. Invest more budget dollars for excellent musicians, not volunteers, please. 
Excellent musicians and choir members. Liturgical music is a key enabler for active participation. And Father Britton in his parish actually sponsored scholarships for young people who wanted to major in sacred music. And he said, imagine if every parish in the country would sponsor one student to study at a university to major in sacred liturgy and music. Think of that resource that would come back into the church after they graduated in any instrument or language or discipline they want. Again, be open to the architectural modifications. Use your homilies to instruct and inspire the faithful. We heard a wonderful homily from Father Radley uh, last Sunday on Corpus Christi on the Eucharist. It was a beautiful homily. I think we'd all agree. I encourage him and, and uh, told him, tell him when you hear a good homily. It helps. He gave a very nice homily. Again, promote sacred silence, not the din of Union Station. And lastly, by bringing in beautiful music and art and literature into homilies, you can evangelize the culture once again. Not everyone who's in church is even Catholic or Christian. They're curious. They come in, they observe and watch. And if they see and observe something beautiful, that's attractive. And if they see and observe something beautiful that is godly, that attracts them to God. If they see nonsense, they walk away. So that's what I have for tonight. We actually do have time for questions. So uh, I think there was a question there. Yes. Um, the, the new mass, the Novus Ordo, is a, can be a beautiful expression of the liturgy. Uh, and um, your experience, I mean, I, I smile when I hear you talking because I also felt similarly. Uh, back in the 80s when I was in college, I went to, I was going to try and tie masses before it was cool. And um, Monsignor Schuler at St. Agnes in the Twin Cities, uh, imagine um, I was able to go to the Requiem Mass of Mozart with the full Minnesota Symphony Orchestra. And I couldn't, and, and I was, I had a minor in Latin too, um, and I couldn't help realizing that this is beautiful and this is inspirational. Uh, and I felt that it was overdone because this is an interesting way to celebrate the Good Friday, Easter Sunday historical events. This perpetual act of Christ's adoration of the Father, uh, is it always going to be tethered to uh, Western styles of worship between 1500 and 1900? Is that the highest expression we're allowed to have for all time? That seems a bit uh, of a squint uh, culturally, particularly where you see the church is actually growing. It's growing in places where the Tridentine Mass is not predominant at all. Uh, so I think it's good to have both. I, the good news is if I were Pope, you could have both and, and uh, l let it rip. Um, we have this needless antagonism today, in my opinion. It doesn't have to exist. Both rights are valid. Both rights, I believe, are beautiful when properly done. They both can be abused. So um, I think that uh, the reform of the liturgy was meant to promote this active participation in a way that perhaps is not occurring on scale. Not everyone is going to be as devout as you or have that same experience. And so the question becomes, what scales for the most people? If you look at Africa, for example, uh, in 1900 there were about uh, 2 million Catholics in Africa. Now there's 150 million Catholics in Africa. They, they didn't grow up speaking Latin, and Latin doesn't resonate with them. Think of the areas of the world where 
Christianity Catholicism is just getting some toll holds in Asia. One of the most beautiful things that inspired me when I was working in China was hearing Chinese school children singing the Our Father in English. That was beautiful to me. Uh, first generation in a communist country singing the Our Father in English. Um, military chaplains will tell you they're in field masses in English on a rickety table are some of the most inspired masses uh, they've ever said. Uh, so um, the church is promulgating norms for the entire church throughout the world. And what John the 23rd I think had in mind is we have more to say to the world uh, than what we have been saying. Follow up, yes. I believe the core issue has to begin and end with the spirituality of the priest. He has to have a Eucharistic spirituality and he has to have a Marian spirituality. And you have to have both. And, and you can tell the spirituality of a priest by how they say Mass. And, and it has to start there. So we can talk about moving things around, we can talk about music and this and that. It has to be the holiness of the priest that starts there. The right assists all priests in conducting the mass properly, but the spirituality of the priest is primary. Everything else, it doesn't matter. It's important, but that's the driving force. And then everything else finds its place. I, I think that there has to be some move within uh, the leadership, though. The bishops have to uh, understand this, and I think the good ones do. I think the continuing education of, and spiritual retreats should be mandated. Uh, priests don't get to pick their time off all the time, let's just, for example. A bishop should say, Here's stock curricula throughout your life as a priest that you will do every, whatever the appropriate period of time is, in your time off, uh, or whatever the arrangement needs to be, uh, as part of this ongoing nourishing, creating a fraternity as well of priests throughout their entire life, rooted in the Eucharist, rooted in the Mass, rooted in the Rosary. These things are not optional anymore. And the pruning that is going on in the church, in the West, this pruning, for example, uh, in 1985, there were 450 parishes in the Archdiocese of Chicago. Now, there's 221. So this pruning of the tree is forcing, I'm happy to say, the and Dr. Melanie will affirm this, the quality of the guy going into the seminary today is much higher than it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and, and so on. If you're going into the seminary to become a priest today, given all of the slings and arrows that you will take, you have a vocation, and you have the right kind of vocation. I can tell you in my, well, I won't go into it, but in my day, the motives were very different. The motives today, I think, are much healthier uh, and much more interested in saving people in bringing God to people and much less in changing the world in terms of whatever secular agenda flavor of the day is. We change the world for Christ, not for some other ridiculous program. Good. So thank you all for coming today. We got through that pretty well, not too bumpy. We'll see you next week. All right.